Yes. Good okay. morning, good afternoon, good evening, distinguished participants. We are going to proceed with the opening remarks now. And I'm giving the floor to UN Resident Coordinator for Mauritius and Seychelles, Ms. Christine Oni. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, good, uh, good morning for some people. Good afternoon from us here. Thank you very much for inviting me to give a few remarks at the beginning of this meeting, very important meeting where we are looking at uh, enabling small island states to achieve SDGs through more forward-looking and holistic planning and governance. Um, allow me to skip the protocols. I don't know exactly who is here, but I know our friend Elizabeth Agatine, and I think someone from Ministry of Finance from Mauritius, and everybody, all protocols of that. Um, I'll just say a quick few words that I have noted on the paper here. We all know that uh, Mauritius and Seychelles are small islands, developing states, and uh, well on their uh, good development agenda. As the UN resident coordinator, I cover both countries. And uh, we see that uh, they have a high development, human development index. By uh, populations having access to education, uh, health, and all the services. But we also know that there are pockets of people with poverty level. There are still pockets of poverty. At the same time, we have noted that there are challenges. These islands face challenges, and we must advocate for them because their small size, remoteness, impact to climate change, sea rise levels, and other climate-related challenges pose special vulnerabilities. We have seen it during this COVID crisis, which brought everything to the open, which we already know that they, they put most of their food and energy. They rely on a few sectors on the economy, including tourism, fisheries, and finance sector. And we all know that any disruption, whether COVID, the border closure, uh, disaster of any nature, really causes very severe difficulties. And this uh, almost you know, um, brings them to uh, a standstill in some cases. And uh, we see loss of jobs, livelihood, loss of income. And this was all evident during COVID that it, it's really, uh, these are really vulnerable uh, islands to such huge shocks like that. Uh, so uh, I'm sure the PS and the analysts will be talking about it more, but I'm sure uh, long-term visions uh, are, are in order. And I think for such islands, it's important to look at how to stop the over-reliance on food and energy importation to diversify economies in ways that contribute to sustainable development. Now, the UN uh, and these seeds, how do we work well knowing that there is limited access to ODA? So the engagement is, is a little bit different from what we would do in South Sudan or any of those countries. So we engage more on, health, on, on policy support, on capacity building, brainstorming on alternative financing modalities, seeking for other global funds like the Global Climate Funds, the JEF, and so on, but also thinking beyond funding to financing. So since the UN reform, uh, where we are all uh, encouraged to work in an integrated manner, the UN is supporting the governments to really think more about working in, uh, through a multi-sector uh, approach and acting in an integrated manner. We at the UN also are supposed to follow suit and to work in a coherent way. There are over 20 agencies that are doing something um, in this in these islands, in areas like health, environment, education, climate change, human rights, industrialization, food system, just to mention a few. Therefore, we also had to design 
a cooperation framework for, for Seychelles. It was the first one ever, the cooperation framework, and we call it the strategic partnership framework. And for Mauritius, the last one had been in 2003. So we had to do one single consolidated document that brings our work together. We also uh, saw the countries themselves doing their own voluntary national review on the progress towards the SDGs. At this point, actually, the both countries asked for technical assistance in better measuring progress on SDGs and, have, and for stronger capacities in SDG planning for their national development process. So uh, I won't go into the details, but we all know that the SDGs are interlinked. Just for example, welfare of children cannot choose poverty reduction and not quality of education or better jobs. So we all need those things for welfare of, of, of a child, they say. Or instead, um, we need to measure this in terms of proper nutrition, education, healthcare, and so on. Similarly, you cannot choose marine resources that surround small island states without choosing economic growth or without looking at economic growth and environmental pro, uh, uh, preservation at the same time. This is just to demonstrate the interlinkages of SDGs. So in a way, we must find ways to promote policy coherence, multi-sector interventions while promoting long-term planning for sustainable development in both economic, social, and environmental terms. I'm, I'm rushing through because I know I have only five minutes. Um, so when the COVID crisis hit, it looks, for, in our view, in everybody's view, to put a temporary hold to long-term planning, as both governments were focusing on immediate needs. But at the same time, this crisis and other crises, because I know that in Mauritius we also had the Wakashi crisis, it also brought the UN to work more closely and uh, uh, it also helped us reflect more globally and regionally on these vulnerabilities and came up with the vulnerability index, which is going to be an important tool in continuing to advocate for the seeds. But at the same time, we are working closely with the UN and government to think about how to better collaborate towards SDGs. So in 2021, as part of the UN reform, but also to answer the request from the government. UNDESA and UNTAL partnered with the resident coordinator's office uh, to answer to the question of mainstreaming SDGs in the planning process. Um, the partnership started with a policy coherence study conducted with government and national development stakeholders that reviewed how over the last two decades, uh, Mauritius and Seychelles had responded to crisis, including the COVID crisis and the extent to which the sector responses were aligned with the long-term development priorities. This approach has allowed to develop very interesting maps that link together the different economic, social, and environmental impacts of the crisis and their response and help better understand the multi-sector effects of policy decisions trying to address each issue. It, it hence highlights the need to work together to design well-integrated development plans well integrated offers of technical assistance between the many different UN specialized agencies and organizations who are ready to help. Further, we recently held uh, the first multi sector policy dialogue between the government and particularly with the government of Seychelles um, to review the nation's development ambitions and uh, its needs for support and the possible assistance that the UN can offer over uh, the years to come. This exchange at the highest levels allowed us all to understand the multi-sector aspects of the current and future development issues, as well as the numerous offers of support possible from UN side, which must all be integrated in a coherent update of our current cooperation framework with the officials. To end, learning from this approach, we are hoping to build a similar process soon in Mauritius with the government of Mauritius. Uh, and our key development partners here. We now need to transform this into an integrated over support from the UN side with long-term ambitions of sus uh, sustainable development by developing our new cooperation framework 2024-2028 for each nation using the same approach. To achieve this, the UN system will further support Mauritius and Seychelles 
with two complementary support. One, to build capacity of the two nations to develop approaches of integrated planning based on system thinking. Second, with providing technical assistance on how to finance the SDGs, making best use of existing resources, tapping new innovative ones, and working with the nations and the international financial system to develop new instruments to finance the development ambitions of Mauritius and Seychelles, and hopefully learn from this for the other seeds facing the, uh, the same challenges. The approach of system thinking and integrated uh, planning that will be discussed today will serve both governments and the the UN in our efforts to work more effectively and coherently together as we look to achieve the SDGs. So again, I really want to thank uh, the UNDES and Lintel team, but to thank the entire UN system. Most importantly, to thank the governments who are really working in tandem and uh, post COVID, post all these challenges, the need to do things coherently is, is just the right time. And if I can quote from the president of uh, Seychelles who said it's time to stop working in silos and working in a, con uh, in a consolidated manner to ensure to achieve results. Um, I mean, I will stop at that quote, but it was a, a strong message which we had clearly. And with these few remarks, I want to wish you very good collaborations. I may stay a bit and go in another meeting, but really thank you for this idea event. It's very, very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, I'm now going to pass the floor to Mr. Einar Bjorgo, uh, Director of the Division, Division for Satellite Analysis and Applied Research from the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. Thank you, Elena, and good evening, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pressure and an honor for me to, be, to open this session together with uh, UNDESA's Division for Public Institutions and Digital Government with a space for countries and particular SIDS to exchange on how they have been working to turn the multiple crises of today into opportunities. We often hear that SIDS are at the front line of climate change. A couple of years ago, I had also had the pressure myself to visit some coastal communities in Fiji and are learning from the local elders there what were their priorities. And that was, of course, very, very insightful. Um, SIDS also have um, been at the front line of the COVID-19 with tourism flows plummeting overnight and staying low for two years. And the food security issues have become very acute for many small island states already during the COVID-19 crisis due to their high dependence of, on energy and food imports before the current disruption in the food, in the food markets. In fact, SIDS can, can teach all of us on integrated planning as the need for integrated approaches is more obvious to them than many other countries. SIDS are highly vulnerable to impacts of policies and decision taking elsewhere on climate change and the environment. The survival, their survival depends on that. They have been highly dependent on international trade, including in, on imports of essential food and energy supplies. Ocean resources that represent an important source of food and income for small state fishermen and women in coastal communities are at the same time threatened by external factors such as ocean acidification and sea temperature rises. Illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing and plastic pollution currently estimated at more than 136 million metric tons in the global ocean with 7 million tons uh, additional tons added every year. Dream destinations for many tourists, SIDS are quickly learning the lessons about making tourism sustainable as pollution at small scale is more visible and more damaging. Together, SIDS have been very effective in sharing knowledge about making their voice heard on the international arena on oceans, issues of trade, and we hope soon on climate change. During the COVID-19 crisis, many SIDS have been disastrous so in socioeconomic effects and disruptions on human mobility and international trade. There's also been an opportunity to think about how to turn their main wealth, oceans, into a source of sustainable living while protecting the planet. The Seychelles have been doing so in pioneering work on blue economy with its young national university offering courses on this topic. They have done so in cutting edge work 
on engaging with diaspora too, and have been looking into innovation and how to strengthen human potential. We look forward to hearing from Ms. Alette Aganin, National Planning Department of the Ministry of Finance and Social more today about their vision on how the future will look and uh, how new national development strategies can push for these transformations um, that account for global to local and interrelated intersectoral connections. The government of Mauritius has been working closely also on better address food security and decrease energy import dependence. It has been aiming at an ambitious target of reaching 60% of renewable energy in its, ex in its energy mix already by 2030. The UN has been working together with the government of Mauritius under the PAGE and other projects to help support the greening um, of the economy of the island. We'll be hearing from Ms. Rakash Bushkori, Minister Councillor from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Mauritius about their work, as well as from the UN country team about some specific projects. Integrated approaches are also relevant for the, U for the UN to provide a more coherent support, as we just heard, to governments and, and uh, as they work together across a number of areas. Colleagues from the uh, recent coordinator office will talk, us, will talk to us about uh, this important aspect too. And both of us, UNITAR and UNDESA, have had the opportunity and to appreciate the fruitful engagement and effective support of recent coordinator, Ms. Christine Umimuti, and her team, as we have been working together in preparing um, uh, in integrated planning with both countries. Finally, uh, we would like to hear from all participants today about their take on integrated policies and planning, successful practices and lessons learned. There will be space not only for questions and answers, but also discussion and sharing of experience. So with this, I wish a successful event to all and pass the floor um, to back to, to you, Elena. Thank you very much, um, Einar. So, uh, Unfortunately, uh, Miss Adriana Alberti uh, from UNDESA could not join us today. She was called in another um, uh, HLPF event. Uh, so at this point, uh, we can uh, consider the opening part uh, finished and we will move into our first session that I will be moderating on country experiences on integrated planning. And I would like to, as I put up uh, my slides, I would like to quickly mention that we had some uh, small uh, changes in the agenda. Um, and uh, I will walk you through as uh, we go through the session, um, also on the names of the participants. And in addition to representatives from uh, Seychelles and Mauritius, we will also have a guest speaker uh, from uh, Cyprus, a European Union, a small island country today who will share uh, their experience as well. So uh, now let me start by just very quickly uh, setting the stage for the first session as uh, we move into the country presentations. So we are going to talk about the integrated planning today and the second part of the side event will focus on uh, uh, methodological aspects in more detail. Uh, but let me just say a few words for why uh, we believe integrated planning is important for the SDGs. So we already talked that it helps to work um, across sectors and dimensions so that we don't think only about environmental, social, or economic dim dimensions, but we think about them um, as a whole. Uh, also, we don't think only about agriculture um, or only separately about uh, employment or health, etc. But again, we think about synergies, interlinkages, and trade-offs. Uh, it also allows to plan across different time horizons so that we, we, we try to estimate effects across sectors, but also across short-term time horizons and long-term time horizons. Integrated planning is very important because typically you use a participatory approach and you engage with stakeholders and this helps to build their ownership and commitment to the implementation of the National Development Strategy or SDG Action Plan. Uh, it helps you to review alternative 
uh, policy scenarios and formulate as a result an optimal set of transformative policies that can help you bridge long-term objectives, but at the same time meet the immediate needs in a way uh, that uh, also aligns with this long-term vision. And finally, integrated planning, and we'll talk a little bit more about the concept of system thinking that we are using in the integrated planning in the second part, but overall, it helps you to stay agile and resilient and also make course corrections when needed. Uh, in short, it allows you to break the silos, move away from more linear thinking. When we think about only immediate causes of what is happening or immediate impacts of our policies and think more in a circular way where there are multiple interconnections between sectors also um, um, over different time horizons. Uh, and with this note, um, I would like to uh, invite the first speaker uh, who will be um, talking about um, basically with the speakers who will be discussing their experiences with planning, also long-term planning and bridging uh, the immediate needs. And I would like to invite the first speaker uh, from uh, the first speaker from uh, um, uh, the Ministry of Finance of Seychelles, Ms. Elizabeth Agatin, Principal Secretary from the Economic Planning Department. Uh, Ms. Agatin, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Let me just switch. Let me just switch on my camera. Um, okay, good afternoon. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, in terms of our experience for Seychelles, um, when the SDGs itself was launched in 2015, uh, we saw Seychelles moving towards uh, a more sustainable development um, model for development itself. And in 2015 itself, we attained a high income status. And in 2019, we became uh, we attained the very high human development uh, index, um, and it was the first African country to do so. In 2020, we presented our VNR for the first time as well. And in the VNR itself, we, we took a very broad view of the Seychelles uh, developmental aspect. In 2018, the country, uh, after a, a long time, embarked on a process to come up with its long -term, country's long-term vision as well as its uh, first five-year national development strategy. And in doing so, the SDGs were incorporated into the national planning framework and in core government business as such. The national long-term vision, which we uh, call the Vision 2023, and the NDS at that point echoed the goals and desired outcome of the 20, uh, 2030 agenda. So, the process itself back then began with uh, a visioning exercise, which had the aim of determining what was the, as a nation, what kind of society we wanted and where was it that we wanted to be in the next 15 years or so. So we did that and then following which we, the vision 2023 then was to include an elaboration of three different five-year national development strategies. The first one was the National Development Strategy of 2019 to 2023. And that, like I said, took into account the global and regional commitments, including um, the SDGs. The NDS then is further supported um, by sectoral and institutional strategies um, developed by the various sectors, as well as the ministries, departments, and agencies who as a rule must ensure that they have the global commitments mainstreamed and taken into account when they work on their respective plans and strategies. So NDS 2019 to 2023, which is the current development uh, planning document we have, focuses on all the 17 SDGs and also identifies which associated targets and the indicators we are to prioritize. Following this exercise, then, um, what we had in the NDS at that point was 
our vision 2033, like I said, and then six thematic pillars uh, which support our, which will support our future um, national development strategies. The pillars in the current document at this point is governance, people at the center of development, social cohesion, um, economic transformation, environment sustainability and resilience, as well as science, technology and innovation for development. So this is the current document we have, but um, at this point, I would also like to point out that we are in the process of revisiting our national development strategy in view of events which has happened in the past two years. We've had a, a changing sort of economic environment due to COVID and more recently the Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis. We've also had a change in government in, in, in 2020 and, and, and the very sort of geopolitical and economic landscape has warranted that we revisit our national uh, development strategy. And in doing so, uh, while we are doing that sort of revisiting exercise and identifying the priority areas for us to go forward, we are following sort of the same uh, pattern in ensuring that we mainstream the international agendas onto the prior priority areas of the national development. So um, if I'm, I am to highlight in terms of going forward what the priority areas of the government would be, um, you would see that it is linked to the SDGs and we have um, six priority areas, one being the modern public service, uh, modernization and efficient health system, a modern education system aligned with our future needs, a transformative economic agenda, a promotion of law and order, as well as environmental sustainability and climate change and resilience. So these priority areas, uh, all of them take into account various of, this, of, the, of the SDGs, as well as the targets, like I've mentioned before. So what are the, the challenges that as a, as a country, when we've been trying to do this exercise, that we've uh, been faced with. One of the key challenges that, that we are faced with is the human resource constraints. That in, in, it, in itself is a form of limited personal trained and adequately versed in the matters regarding to the SDGs. So even if we're asking them to please mainstream that into policy making, mainstream that into planning, um, the fact that we have limited personnel who are adequately trained or well-versed in matters related to SDGs is an impediment. So like, uh, I mean, for a small state, for us, human resource constraints are a daily reality. And then there is also uh, the, like I said, lack of awareness on SDGs, data collection frameworks, data gaps. So these are weaknesses that when we were preparing for our first ENR, which was submitted in 2020, it was identified when we did um, a baseline, uh, sort of a baseline survey for us to, to see where we are with the implementation of the SDGs. So we identified some of, of, of these gaps and these gaps are still there. And these are some of the challenges that we need to, to work on. And recent events, like I said, ha has highlighted how vulnerable we are as a country to external shocks. COVID-19 was a clear, is a clear example of that. Um, with the border, uh, the closing of the borders, it, it was very clear. Tourism for us accounts for approximately 25% of our economy and, and uh, directly and indirectly an estimated 75%. And crucially, uh, it accounts for seven, around 76% of our foreign exchange earnings. So with COVID-19, with the closing of the borders and in a sort of stop, as stopping tourism activities, it really took its toll on us as a country because that is the mainstay of our economy. And in addition, we're also a country that imports uh, more than 90% of what we consume. So it, it really highlighted uh, the realities of how prone and how vulnerable we are to external shocks. So with COVID, with the Ukraine-Russia crisis, I think some of the important lessons and the opportunities that has been spoken about that we we have learned and that we are uh, the, being the main takeaways for us is that it's very important for us to learn from the past and to prepare ahead 
And this is where the, the planning becomes important. It has, it has also highlighted the importance of, of um, strategic planning, of planning itself when resources are very limited, because we need to, do, to, to prioritize on what we spend our resources on. And if we are to not leave anybody behind, we need to ensure that we, we get that prioritization right. Um, the element of contingency planning as well has become more relevant. And it is something which maybe uh, we don't necessarily take seriously at all times, but I think the recent events highlighted how contingency planning is important, how foresight is important. So the capacity to be able to do that is, is very, very important. So at this point, I would also like to recognize the assistance from the UN family that we've been receiving over the years to actually mainstream the, the SDGs into, into the work we do, uh, namely from UNDP and more recently UNDESA, UNITA, uh, and the assistance that they will be providing us going forward in building the capacity within the public sector. Because like I've hi highlighted, one of the key challenges is the lack of awareness about the SDGs, and uh, especially within our public sector. And that makes it difficult for us to be able to mainstream, to monitor, and to ensure that it features in our plans and in our policies. Because it's only through the mainstreaming that we are going to be able to guarantee the financing for, for it through the budgeting process and have that maximum implementation that we all strive for. So for me, um, that would practically be it in terms of the experience of Seychelles. And, and why is that planning important? Because if, if we don't plan, we know that we are definitely going to fail. And like I said, recent events have shown us that we, learned, we need to learn from the past and prepare for the future. I think COVID-19 um, has presented us with a very good opportunity to build, build back and build back better. And to address maybe some of the weaknesses that we, we had before, and some of the loopholes that, that we've seen so that we can actually build that better and make sure that we don't leave no one behind. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Miss Agatin. That was um, extremely insightful. I guess also talking about the crisis as an opportunity for building back better and also about contingency planning. These are really key topics also uh, when we talk about integrated planning. And of course, capacity building uh, is also a, a very critical area. And we are happy to be providing support uh, here together with you and DESA colleagues and also resident coordinators office. Um, I will now move uh, to the next speaker. Um, but before that, I would like to invite all participants, if you have any questions uh, for the panelists, for Ms. Agatin already, for example, please feel free to type them in the chat, uh, in the chat box. And we will have a questions and answer session after uh, this first series of presentations. So I will now uh, give the floor um, uh, to, uh, Minister, uh, to, to Mr. Latanraj Gorak lead analyst from Economic Planning and Development, uh, Ministry of Finance of Mauritius. Uh, so um, Mr. Gorak uh, is going to talk about um, integrated appro approaches to support the SDGs and national planning in Mauritius. Um, the floor is yours. Unmute, uh, Mr. Gora. Mr. Gora, you are on mute. You need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Maybe I'd, I'd said I'd like to uh, thank uh, Mrs. Christine Umutoni, our UN President Coordinator. And also, uh, good morning from uh, uh, for our New York colleagues from Yendesa and Inter. So this gives us a great opportunity to talk about the whole issue of uh, planning, and uh, maybe just to get into the uh, the debate 
maybe just to give you some historical background, how Mauritius has been faring in terms of planning. So in the 70s, we used to have the economic planning unit, and uh, which was set up to drive the economic agenda in terms of export strategy and also diversification, and which later uh, became a full-fledged Minister of Economic Planning and Development. And over, like within span of three decades, there have been a number of uh, development plans that have been produced and to steer the economy forward. And also there have been like political uh, review of those plans, whether we're on the right track or not. Eventually in 2006, we, the Minister of Planning has been merged with the Minister of Finance to create synergies and also to ensure that whatever targets, whatever plans are being made, it is uh, within the, uh, uh, the fiscal space. And we also have the uh, different cadres of both ministries, uh, which have been much like economist, accountant, and budget officer to give more uh, meaningful impact to planning, how you plan within the uh, resource constraint and also taking into account the objective of the country. Now, in 2020, 19 or 20, we had the Ministry of Finance, Economic Planning and Development. So uh, economic planning has been given more prominence in terms of new portfolio uh, attached to the Ministry of Finance. And in the government program of 2020 to 2024, it has been mentioned that we need to have an economic planning and research bureau to develop the economic agenda and also to drive uh, the, uh, to work with the private sector and other civil society, as well as with the economic development board. So right now we already have a functional structure at the Ministry of Finance, which is being uh, uh, led by a deputy financial secretary. And we are in the process of uh, manning the unit in terms of uh, economists and analysts. So we still, we have a long way to go in terms of uh, having appropriate staffing structure with the right competencies and so on. But notwithstanding that, we already have uh, set up a number of commissions uh, working on thematic issues like export competitiveness, manufacturing sector, the tourism sector, and so on. So these commissions, which are co-chaired by both government representative and also by private sector representative, they meet with different stakeholders and they chart out different uh, actions in order to, uh, to reach goals and targets. So those goals and targets are basically uh, uh, helping to drive the economic agenda of government over a span of five years, according to the government program, five year period. And also these, whatever recommendation proposals are come out from those commissions, they are fed into uh, the budget speech. So these are a bit of the internal aspect of how uh, we are uh, dealing with the planning issue. And uh, notwithstanding that, uh, maybe uh, just to give you a flavor of uh, the planning tools that we have, we already have a vision 2030 and also a government program, five year program from 2020 to 2024. We also have a number of sector strategies that have been developed in different sectors. And more important, uh, we have a three year strategic plan covering the different sectors of the economy, which detail out the targets and also outcomes. Outcomes like over the 10 years period, and also targets mean, because normally when you have the budget and also when we prepare the strategic plan, this is a span of a period of three years. And we need to see how we can uh, reach the targets or outcomes within the uh, fiscal space available. But 
more importantly, I think in the, the as the UN resident coordinator was saying, maybe we need to uh, move forward and see how really we can uh, engage with development partners like UN and UNDP, UNITA and so on to build capacity and also to see what are the skills gap in terms of planning for what sectors we need to have uh, strategies and so on so that we can have a more agile and resilient economy. We know that uh, the uh, global uh, disruptions in the chain, distribution and production chain. And now uh, we also have in above other black funds, you no know, COVID and so on. So it has been a bit difficult for countries to plan ahead in the wake of uh, the shocks, demand and supply shocks. And we need to very like have a plan, agile planning system so that we can uh, deliver fast and also see how we can uh, protect uh, the vulnerable people from the impact of the ongoing Ukraine, Ukraine war and COVID and also and so on. And uh, the uh, Mrs. Tony was mentioning about the country strategy frameworks that are being developed for the next five years, maybe it, it, uh, it is highly opportune that we need to think together, fit, sit together to see what kind of action, what kind of plan we need to have. And also in terms of indicators and outcome, which should be smart. So we need to translate whatever motherhood statement uh, we have on the planning perspective and how we can translate the strategies plans into concrete action with clear uh, uh, deliverables and also uh, indicators so that we can bring a meaningful impact on the quality of living. On, uh, on another point which I, I, I wish to, uh, to talk is uh, on uh, basically four pillars of, uh, of development on which government is focusing. First, we have the uh, inclusive growth. Inclusive growth means poverty and social well-being and so on. Maybe we need to do some research on how we want to uh, achieve inclusive growth, inclusive development. Is taking everyone on board. No one is on the sideline. Especially, we know how the cost of living and inflation is impacting severely on the, uh, you know, the vulnerable people. Second is in the high-income uh, country, high-income agenda. As you are aware, in 2019, uh, we have been classified as high income economy and also as very high human development index uh, as per UNDP report. So we need to see uh, what kind of measures, strategy we need to be in place so that we can uh, try to uh, join the league of uh, high income country. Third pillar here will be the safe, safe Mauritius. That is safe in terms of uh, 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 where there's no social ills, uh, no domestic violence, tourists can come freely, and also in terms of surveillance on the health system to avoid any resurgence in uh, uh, communicable diseases and so on. And also at the same time, uh, communicable disease, you know, Mauritius requires the incidence of diabetes quite high in Mauritius. And fourth pillar on which we need to work further uh, will be on the green, green Mauritius. That is how we adopt the circular economy, how we uh, uh, facilitate the transition to uh, the renewable energy, how we reach that reach the target of 60% of uh, clean energy by 2030. So these are the uh, four main pillars on which we need to work and how the planning system, how our planning tools can be harnessed to work to achieve the targets that we need to define under those specific areas. And I'm glad that uh, uh, for uh, the country strategy framework that will be developed with UNDP, and I believe also there will be on the other uh, program of assistance with the other development partners, we need to sit down and see how we can really uh, put uh, into action those strategies. And this is where the, uh, the whole aspect of uh, planning comes into force. But before ending, maybe uh, two, uh, two aspects on, on which we need to 
to uh, really work hard is the uh, institutional aspect of planning. What type of planning do we need to have national, sectoral, and how to go about it in terms of creating institutions? And uh, also, secondly, how to uh, develop uh, indicators, how we develop targets, indicators, and how we empower like central ministries, like Minister of Finance, and also line ministries, how we need to empower those ministries so that they are aligned uh, and on board with what we are doing in terms of planning. So these are critical factors. So once we have already have the pillars, next we need to define the internal aspect. Second is uh, define the targets, define the outcomes, define the sectoral strategies that will be aligned with national goal and vision. And third aspect is how to empower the agencies, implementing agencies to, uh, to implement those strategies and, measure, and measures. And importantly, uh, because we have been talking about uh, monitoring, but we need to also have tools like how to evaluate and how to measure outcomes. So these are the few points that I would like to, uh, to share with you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was um, also very insightful um, uh, to hear uh, from your experience. Um, and uh, I think our second segment would in fact uh, touch upon some of the uh, issues uh, that, was, that were raised in the presentation by Mr. Gora, uh, such as, for example, um, indicators, what kind of indicator framework do we need to have so that as to promote better collaboration between ministries or also institutions, you talk about the importance of institutions and capacities because strategy on, it, on its own would not be sufficient. Um, I would now uh, move to our uh, next speaker, um, uh, Mr. Pierre Palavier, a Senior Partnership Advisor from Resident Coordinator's Office uh, for Mauritius and Seychelles. Um, and I would like um, our colleagues um, uh, to kindly try to uh, respect the time allocation that uh, we had for the uh, interventions. So uh, Pierre is going to talk about um, integrated approaches for national development planning and UNCT support uh, to the two countries. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm Pierre Falavier. I work with the resident coordinator's office for both Mauritius and Seychelles. And what I do is to support our UN entity and our national counterparts, both from government, civil society, or the private sector, to think of and to implement strategic collaboration. So what I'll do is rapidly I'll highlight how over the last few years we on the UN side have been developing a gradually more integrated approach in our reflection and our support. Uh, to the government of Mauritius and Seychelles and how we hope it can evolve. Um, our resident coordinator mentioned uh, the UN reform that started in 2019. And in our case, the first activity under that reform to promote some integration and coherence of UN support to the long-term development uh, uh, vision of both nations was to develop this strategic partnership framework that would be aligned with the nation's own national development strategies. In fact, Prior to 2019, both nation, as both nations were doing particularly well in terms of development, the physical presence of the UN in the countries had drastically reduced. Most agencies were based in their regional headquarters and they had become used to providing more ad hoc support when requested by individual ministries or agencies. Also, because of the lack of funding for upper income nations, neither, they, our, neither our agencies nor the governments could always see how to intervene through the kind of traditional programs of the UN in which you send a few technical assistance for a couple of years, along with the funding necessary to implement projects. So with this approach, this kind of limited the demand on the one side, but also the offer of service from our side. The strategic par partnership framework that we prepared for 2019 to 2023 already helped link the work of the UN agencies by better aligning the contributions to the long-term needs of the nations uh, following their national development plan. So now our five-year strategic framework aligned with the government uh, guides how the individual support from each agency is linked to these development needs 
and how it is linked to complementary work by other UN agencies. I think our resident called in to mention it, but we do have 20 different agencies working in Mauritius and Seychelles, uh, each in very specific areas. And the idea is how we make sure that they work together is much more than the sum of each of these individual contribution. Now, through this very simple first step of, well, not simple, but this first step of coming up with this strategic partnership framework, for instance, in Seychelles, we can see how six of our agencies contribute to developing the blue economy, each from its particular strength whether it is from environmental preservation point of view, the promotion of marine research, support to small businesses, or even the development of school curriculum that better include understanding the role of the ocean on the small island states. So already these frameworks give us, uh, give some clear direction to our agencies to better integrate the individual support. Um, so setting up such a framework was the first step uh, for, for us to better coordinate our intervention and as well as for the government to better understand how the impact of all these individual contribution could serve the long-term development goal. Now, if we look in practice, by implementing these activities under the partnership framework, the need for, but also the value of this multi-sectoral, more integrated work became more obvious. And I'll give a few examples. Um, in Mauritius, for instance, a strong request from the government was for the UN to support a complete review of Mauritius preparedness in terms of disaster risk and to help develop a strategic response to manage risk and to reduce the risk of disaster. So in 2019 and 2020, the UN sent disaster risk experts from seven of its agencies, as well as from the EU and from NGOs. They worked with the government to conduct a diagnosis of national and local capacity to manage disaster risk. Um, this joint assessment worked as a multidisciplinary team that assessed disaster risk and preparedness in a wide range of sectors that included tourism, agriculture, the environment, water and sanitation, health, and education. This analysis led to further collaboration between all of our agencies and the government to prioritize the very large number of recommendations that were to be addressed to strengthen disaster risk preparedness. And since then, um, the UN has been designing a series of collaboration between these agencies to provide support to implement such recommendations. Now, in 2020, we had a clear example of what it meant in practice. Mo moving from an integrated strategy to an integrated response, we put this collaboration in practice when an oil spill hit Mauritius. Uh, there, the UN was able to respond promptly and in a coordinated manner to support the government uh, and, and other development partners in their response to this major oil spill, in part thanks to the existing co coordination mechanisms that we had, the results of this teamwork done during the risk assessment and the team that was built then. Um, and we then were able to send quickly people who already knew about Mauritius, knew about one another, and could respond to many different components of that incident. We had specialists of oil spill from the Inter International Maritime Organization and the UN Environmental Program, specialists ready to deal with the possible displacement of large population from the International Organization for Migration. We had investigation experts from UN Office for Drug and Crime. We have colleagues from UNDP working on the social and economic impact assessments. We had colleagues from the World Health Organization looking at public health issues related to this oil spill. So, and then we had coordination specialists uh, from both the Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and our UN uh, uh, resident coordinator's office. So this is just to say that this immediate, the immediate response, but also the support to assess damage, to come up with remedial solutions and to update later on the national oil spill response plan wouldn't have worked without a system thinking approach and integration of the responses across all the UN agencies and across government offices. Um, now, if I uh, move from, from, from Mauritius, I will give some examples that cover both Mauritius and Seychelles. Um, Sorry, just to mention that Sorry, uh, we almost, are close to the end of here. Okay, I'm almost running out of time, so I'll just go very quickly. But just to say that over in the response to COVID, the response from the UN was not only, was not only a health response, it was also a social and economic response in which all of our 20 agencies actually contributed and worked together uh, to help 
immediately respond to the health crisis, to the social crisis, to help protect people and ensure that uh, services would be, would be continued even to most, the most vulnerable ones. Also to help with studies and with options looking at what to do for the future to rebuild better. I will uh, now. Joya is going to talk of some, some other very interesting integrated approach then uh, with the green uh, recovery in Mauritius. I will stop there, but just to say that now the work that we intend to do in both Mauritius and Seychelles uh, with the support of DESA and UNITA to provide some training on this more integrated planning uh, along all of these, these five different um, uh, uh, dimension that, that Elena mentioned uh, earlier. Um, it's not just us training the government, but it's also us training ourselves as a UN team and working closely with the government so that we hope that as we can provide support to the government in building your own capacity to, uh, uh, to develop integrated and implement integrated planning, we will do the same within the UN and work together on this as we develop our next cooperation framework and as we develop also with you uh, the components on how to finance this integrated work towards reaching the SDG. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pierre. Um, and we will now have uh, also an intervention uh, by Ms. Joya Panthari, who works as a consultant uh, with UNEP and UN country team uh, for Mauritius and Seychelles, and who also worked with UNDES and UNITAR on integrated planning uh, for Mauritius. So she will talk about some examples of integrated planning and connections with other work uh, that she had been doing. Joya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elena. And uh, thank you to the UNITAR UNDESA team for giving me the opportunity to participate in the side event. It's a real honor and privilege. Um, so hello, everyone, ma'am uh, and colleagues I see in the meeting whom I've had the pleasure to work with in the past. Um, before I start, I'd just like to thank the UNRCO team on fully supporting the UN projects in Mauritius, especially the ones that I have worked with here, um, the PAGE program, uh, the UNIT tourism, uh, of course, the UNITAR UNDESA pro program. Um, working in collaboration with the UNRCO has actually provided rapid action on communicating the program, uh, you know, about details about the program, and also mobilizing key national stakeholders and ensuring the importance of uptake of the recommendations from the various project outcomes. I think this is something really important. Okay, so I just, I'll just talk briefly about the three projects that uh, I have worked on in the past year and this year. Um, so the first one is the UNITAR UNDESA strategic planning um, uh, project for Mauritius and Seychelles. Um, I won't go into much details about it. I will let uh, my colleague Veronique uh, in a later session speak to you more about that. But the idea of the UNITAR uh, UNDESA project was to look at the country from a broader perspective and to comprehend what it faces as a small island developing state, for example, instability due to glo global crises, um, increase in inflation rate and, and so on. Um, and also the current tensions between Ukraine and Russia have really uh, created a lot of different, uh, you know, uh, uh, increases in price and fuel prices, et cetera. So the, this project actually through the systems thinking analysis uh, help and un, un, make us understand and analyze these issues and create an opportunity to build a better and more resilient future, of course, in alignment with the SDGs. Um, bringing all those sectors together and looking at it visually and understanding what is working or what has worked or what should be done, you know, in the future. The, the policy, this policy coherence uh, project validated the recovery programs that were taken by the government of Mauritius. However, it seemed as though some things were not really holding up uh, during the pandemic crisis. For example, the number of SMEs that were affected was quite large and the rise in unemployment. So what we did is we used existing policy and academic research documents as well as interviews with different stakeholders and focus group discussions. We created these models to understand how best to approach the decision making in crisis situations and keeping in mind the long term vision of the country as Mr. Gora mentioned, the 2030 vision. 
So the need for energy and food security, upskilling the workforce and protecting habitat quality were all identified as realities and urgencies. So we can see that these different sectors, uh, they are all connected and they are connected to the GDP. So everything has, has, has something to do with that. So, um, well, the most interesting component of the, the policy coherence integrated planning project was the systems thinking, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this was actually reinforcing the policy making should be a group exercise across various policy domains and sectors, um, resulting in packages that would address all dimensions of sustainable development. So the next project um, that I've been working on since 2019 um, is the PAGE uh, Partnership for Action on Green Economy. Uh, and it has actually been in, with partnering with the government here in Mauritius since 2014. Um, it is a collaboration, as you all know, of five UN agencies, and they provide technical support and implement activities with local partners for various sectors. So we have had many, uh, uh, you know, assessments and studies and reports. The three main focus areas for PAGE is national policy making, thematic and sectoral reform, and capacity building at all levels. Currently. The green recovery program is ongoing, and this is uh, particularly focused on sustainable food systems and the hospitality sector uh, readiness for future crises. Um, one important thing to highlight about this page program in Mauritius is that we actually have formed a national steering committee to review and 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 see the the, the different activities that are taking place and what has happened, what is the status, and what is the update. But most importantly, from this national steering committee is that we have actually brought together all the different line ministries and the NGOs and academia, as well as the private sector to come into one on the, the same table and discuss about these, uh, these programs, these activities that are taking place and what else they think could be done or maybe it's a challenge or an opportunity and how it can also maybe be integrated into other programs that are happening in the country. So it's a great, I think it's a great way of, of, of ensuring collaboration and cooperation among different uh, programs, different ministries, you know, and different uh, stakeholders. Um, so there are, very, there are some very interesting insights from the PAGE program. Um, but what I would like to maybe uh, mention in particular, although the food system dialogues that were organized by the UNRCO office um, with the PAGE uh, team. And it has actually allowed opportunity for the agriculture sector players to share their challenges and ideas for opportunities. So these dialogues have also, uh, you know, in the dialogues that we, there was also discussion about government schemes, which worked well and others that could be improved. So this open dialogue was, was, was wonderful. It was a way to explore and to, have collective action, uh, you know, providing maybe future development and future ideas for the agro sector in Mauritius. So this is a direct example of a starting point to bring together the relevant stakeholders to discuss all these actions, best practices, failures, and even successes, so that the country's vision can be scaled or customized to address these challenges and opportunities. Another example, a very good one, is the Operation Co-Share program again under the Green Recovery Fund, and it is being implemented by ILO and the National Productivity and Competitiveness Council, which is a local partner and PCC. It's a parastatal organization. This program has actually reached 1,000 enterprises and influenced 2,000 enterprises in the food and hospitality sector. The program addressed COVID safety protocols and resource efficiency. Um, so there was capacity building of NPCC trainers, and these trainers are actually conducting site visits, and they are able to obtain firsthand information from enterprises that have been affected by the pandemic. So you can see that there is a lot of good information, insights, everything that can be actually put together. Um, the other, the, the final program that I'm currently working on is the Sustainable Tourism Program by UNEP. It's the Transforming Tourism Value Chains Project which now aims to accelerate resource efficiency and low carbon development in the hotel accommodation sector. So an action plan has been developed. Julia, uh, just to alert you that yeah. uh, <laughs> we are approaching the end of the end.
Okay, right. sure, sure. So basically, so from this uh, program, we have been able to come up with an action plan. And we had a stakeholder advisory group, which was, you know, contributing to this. And um, after the, the action plan has been, uh, you know, uh, developed, we also organized a multi-stakeholder dialogue again with public, private, civil society. Everybody was there and we talked about challenges and opportunities and brainstormed about quick win solutions and long-term solutions. So it, the, all these different, um, you know, um, these different projects have brought actually very good insights and good examples of stakeholder dialogues. And in fact, this can all be connected back to this integrated planning systems thinking approach, uh, you know, understanding to include everybody, the ministries, the private and et cetera, to solve issues or further push successes. You know, maybe there are wonderful successes that can be increased, you know, the capacity for that and keep going with it. So I believe that for integrated planning, these are great examples of stakeholder dialogue that have taken place and you know, outcomes have been identified and organizations uh, have been able to more confidently move in a strategic direction. So it allows all these per perspectives to come to the surface and in turn allow better overall decision-making. So I think this is a very good example of putting all the puzzles of the, uh, you know, pieces of the puzzle together to to create this, uh, you know, overall uh, integrated planning um, exercise. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Julia. So um, we finished the part with the presentations on the work in Seychelles and Mauritius. And we also have a guest speaker with us uh, today from a, a European Union small island country, uh, Cyprus. Um, and as UNITAR, we had been supporting also um, the Ministry of Finance uh, in Cyprus uh, on the SDGs. And we thought their experience as uh, they've actually adopted a, a new long-term strategy. And we are also seeing how to link the implementation of the SDGs, uh, seeing how to help them link the implementation of the SDGs to the strategy better. We thought that this experience could be also interesting to hear uh, about. So I'm going to give the floor now to Ms. Sotiria Irene Sotiropoulos, a second committee expert from the permanent mission of Cyprus to the UN. Thank you. Good morning, dear moderator and distinguished guests. Uh, my delegation is thankful for this timely event on the achievement of SDGs through ambition, ambitious planning and governance, and would like to add on to the discussion by sharing Cyprus's work and experiences in achieving uh, growth in the Cypriot economy. Cyprus has submitted its first national review on the implementation of the 2030 Agenda in 2021. Since then, the Director General for Growth of the Ministry of Finance took the initiative to seek expert support in establishing a governance and monitoring mechanism for the effective integration of SDGs into national policies and for their successful implementation. With the support of exports from UNITAR, and with the help and knowledge of the European Union, we aim to make the Sustainable Development Goals an integral part of all national strategies, overall or thematic, to monitor progress and to plan corrective measures. Operationalizing a whole of government and a whole of society approach creates new requirements for governance mechanisms, coordination, and collaboration on policy design and implementation over short, medium, and long-term horizons. The aim is the creation of a robust strategic framework for the implementation of the SDGs overall and at ministerial sector levels in a nationally owned and EU aligned manner with a roadmap for incorporating social and environmentally sustainable issues in the development of new long term sustainable growth strategies. A national SDG action plan is currently in progress which aims to enable Cyprus to meet SDG goals and to increase performance by focusing on high cross-cutting impact policy initiatives, by exposing synergies and trade-offs to be accounted for by all implementing ministries and by offering a stronger SDG governance framework aimed at promoting greater policy coherence for sustainable development. The action plan leverages key current strategies, policies, and programs that are all expected to help implement the SDGs and provide useful information for their implementation. Furthermore, the SDG action plan contains a three-layered governance model, and it has been developed using a participatory approach involving both government and non-government stakeholders. 
The government ministries share the responsibility for the implementation under the overall coordination of the Ministry of Finance. Within this framework, regular technical collaboration, along with feedback from non-government stakeholders are included as part of a progress review. The National Action Plan allows ministries to lead specific SDGs and to collaborate on their implementation through progress reviews and to reflect them in the government budget. The action plan intends to be updated every year with new actions. Data disaggregation is fundamental for the full implementation of the SDG indicator framework to fulfill the ambition of the 2030 Agenda. In this context, the Government of Cyprus intends to create a monitoring framework and coordination mechanism that will use the SDG action plan data and metadata analysis to review the relevance for Cyprus and with regards to indicators used in EU and SDSN reports for reviewing purposes and assisting policy experts to propose additional indicators. In cooperation with Cyprus's Commissioner for Civil Society, a digital platform has been created for NGOs and other organizations for uploading their activities to promote SDGs. Each year, prizes will be awarded for the best of these activities as an additional incentive to increase the involvement of civil societies and to raise awareness among society. As a small island state, Cyprus is putting a lot of effort to implement the 2030 Agenda through an institutional mechanism that will successfully coordinate the government sector department and to bring together the social factors, civil society organizations, local authorities, and academic institutions. Our intention is to join forces and to implement an ambitious strategy towards promoting the necessary reforms and lead through systemic transformations for achieving economic, social and environmentally sustainable long-term growth and prosperity. In that regard, we once again thank UNITAR for the valuable expertise and knowledge that it offers to Cyprus. And I conclude by congratulating the organizers of this event and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I, I think that was um, a wonderful session with many presentation from uh, the countries. And we are running out of the time now. Uh, we were planning to have um, a small questions and answers session before we go into the next segment. But I would perhaps suggest that uh, we uh, first uh, hear a little bit more on the methodology. And then uh, we um, take, if uh, the time allows, we take uh, one question uh, per country at the end. Uh, I'm going to hand over the floor now to Veronique, who is going, uh, Veronique Therbrugin, Senior Interregional Advisor from the uh, Division for Public Institutions and Digital uh, Government from UNDESA, who is going to moderate that second part. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I would like now to Sorry. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. I would now like to um, go a little bit more into detail and uh, quickly, uh, make, uh, quickly uh, try to hand over to Andrea Bassi, who can uh, explain further, especially on the causal loop diagrams. Uh, so after the interventions of the governments of Mauritius, Seychelles and Cyprus on national development planning, um, we would uh, like to share an approach that we at uh, UNDASA with UNITAR implemented uh, following a request from the UN Multi-Country Office of Mauritius and Seychelles to provide technical support in the area of integrated strategic planning and policy making in support of the SDGs. Um, I would like to highlight that uh, the goal of this project was in the first place to raise awareness and to illustrate how integrated planning can help bridge uh, short-term recovery needs and long-term objectives. Because we have seen that in quite a lot of countries, um, in, in response to COVID, uh, which was uh, unexpected, um, many countries basically moved to um, um, address uh, the, the, the short-term recovery needs and uh, basically potentially doing harm to the, to the long-term um, and sustainable development. Um, so the approach is basically meant to inform the policy planning process at country level. And uh, it has been repeatedly mentioned during different events at the HLBF that multiple crises reduce countries' capacity to respond and recover 
and therefore actions are required that can maximize synergies across policy domains and minimize trade-offs. Um, the approach that we used is based on the use of system thinking, which is uh, what was, um, I think, already mentioned several times also by Elena, and it is meant uh, to help SITS in approaching multiple crises as an opportunity to reassess socioeconomic and environmental performance and allocate investments in areas that address the most pressing concerns caused by the crisis, it, which could also serve as a foundation to avoid the strength of a future crisis or avoid the curve of uh, the future crisis. We basically as I said, we, the, the approach was meant as an awareness raising um, uh, approach, uh, but normally it is, it is supposed to be done, um, in a, it is a participatory approach, uh, where in, in this case we produced uh, reports uh, to illustrate how system thinking's method can be used. First of all, to reach consensus on how the socioeconomic system is functioning, and from this illustrative uh, structure to visualize how specific situations or results can be foreseen, promoted or avoided with planning. And finally, how in the face of the new scenarios of complexity that society will face, new crises such as health crisis, global economic or climate change impacts will require new strategies and institutional planning arrangements. Um, as, as has been highlighted already several times, the pandemic and the current crisis in Ukraine make it clear that, all, that with all systems, um, maybe you can share the first slide, uh, Madina. With all systems, there are, there are uh, surprises and it is important to be well prepared and anticipate for the consequences. So system thinking as an approach is not new, as most of you will know, but it's an approach that is useful to, because it allows us to, to better understand and forecast the outcomes of our decisions. And I would like to emphasize the importance of the forecasting aspect. Um, so forecast the outcomes of decisions across sectors, across economic actors, over time and in space. Here, um, I, I've seen in the chat box, for example, that uh, uh, a question was about how are we going to avoid uh, in future planning that we will concentrate again on tourism uh, or over, over emphasize on tourism. So basically, it's important to do that kind of forecasting to try to move maybe uh, towards a more diversified ec economic planning. It emphasizes the interconnection among several parts within a system rather than focusing on its individual parts. Next slide. In terms of the approach, um, so both UNITAR and DASA worked with a team of consultants and analyzed past actions and outcomes of different decision-making approaches at the time of the crisis. We analyzed current structural problems faced by the country and identified policy opportunities, which we call leverage points, for improving future performance towards sustainable development, while also addressing the most pressing concerns caused by the crisis. So the need basically for short-term response. For this um, next slide, five main methods were used to develop this document. First of all, we did a literature review that was performed to explore past responses to socioeconomic crisis, to identify planning efforts and commitments and availability of budget. We've also done interviews with several national experts to better understand the current policy context and their perception regarding long-term planning and coherence among policies. Causal loop diagrams or system maps were used to map the drivers of change in the system as well as to understand the underlying strategies for policy making at times of crisis. And especially on the causal loop diagrams, I will after this uh, hand over to Andrea, who will basically um, explain further the, the, the visual, the system maps, uh, which have basically been very useful to, to raise the awareness and to explain the uh, methodology. And finally, we've also done focus group sessions to discuss and validate the results as tools and platform to improve the planning and ways to intervene the system. The identification, so we identified then uh, leverage points to intervene the system, to explore and represent how this tool can be useful to enhance long-term planning and policy coherence. So I would like now to give the floor to Andres, Andrea Bassi, expert on system thinking and modeling, to share the system methodology and causal loop diagrams 
that show the main drivers of change that shaped recent development in Mauritius and Seychelles and may determine its future. So Andrea, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronique, for the excellent introduction. All that is left for me is basically to dive straight into the causal diagram exercise, which is a way of visualizing complexity. I will run through this very quickly because it's, I think the purpose is not to present the content of the diagram itself, but to explain the process of developing the diagram and how that supports creating a shared understanding across different stakeholders. So here is the example of Mauritius. And of course, we have one diagram also for Seychelles, based on what Elena mentioned earlier. You may imagine we have developed one for Cyprus as well, but this tool has been used in many other contexts also. And here we start telling the story in a way that emerges from the group model building exercise that we have carried out with COVID-19 and the fact that it has affected tourism arrivals uh, in Mauritius. Now, this has affected tourism infrastructure, although it infrastructure requires still to be maintained and there are costs that remain even if arrivals decline. And we know that in Mauritius it is very important to consider habitat quality for arrivals and tourism infrastructure has had an impact on habitat quality. Now, if we continue looking at the repercussions of these impacts in COVID-19, we see that arrivals determine spending and spending contributes to GDP, which is also supported by habitat quality because in a way, there is a higher price being paid for reaching a place that has something unique to show. Nature is certainly one of the features that the islands would offer. And overall, if tourism GDP contributes to economic growth, then we see that there are other consequences, some desirable and some less desirable. And this highlights how the diagram can be used to provide that objective point of view. For instance, we see that when GDP increases, if we have as a resulting factor air and water pollution, it also increase, we are going to threaten habitat quality. But now you see the diagram develops step by step to see what are the consequences of different events unfolding and trends taking shape over time. So when GDP increases, we have more resources for public spending, which will go into transport infrastructure, among other areas of investment that will support more tourism arrivals, meaning that they will increase the carrying capacity from an infrastructure point of view of the island, but at the same time may affect negatively habitat quality. We then see that with more access, we can have more arrivals, but then if there is more demand for tourism, there is a transition taking place in the agricultural sector in that the value of land potentially used for settlement will increase and that will end up reducing harvested land, which reduces potential agricultural production, which became very important in the context of COVID with a constraint for trade. Now, if we continue, agriculture provides employment. So it is providing an economic contribution as well in the same way as tourism. And then nutrition comes into play when we consider that the access to nutritious food at the country level may actually reduce health spending. While on the other hand, the increase of income and the use of non-traditional products, packaged food and so on, is resulting in the opposite type of outcome in that we have reduced nutrition quality and higher health spending. Now, if you expand the diagram even more, you will see we'll go into other areas. We expand GDP to look at the value of exports and so the competitiveness of the island. We look at the fact that the textile sector has been one of the key contributors to that economic growth based on exports. The financial sector has emerged more recently as an important sector as well. But then we see that the more GDP increases, we have consequences at the local level, including the growth of energy consumption. And the more energy we consume, the more resources we use. And with the use of resources in the energy case would be fossil fuels, the more will be the cost of imports because fossil fuels in the case of Mauritius and most small islands will be imported. Now that reduces the potential for GDP to grow and highlights the need to become leaner, more effective and efficient at the same time. Then we introduce other areas that affect development. One of them is water availability, which is threatened by climate change as we see in the top left corner and the extent to which public spending can prevent some of the impacts that we see, for instance, with education, going into technology and R&D, research and development, which may support agricultural production in the face of water shortages. At the same time, we see that that same investment may actually reduce the availability of labor force in the agricultural sector because of different ambitions of the newer generations in terms of jobs, different aspirations in terms of careers and so on and so forth. So we see from this type of diagram that every time there is an impact, there is 
either a synergy or a side effect that is created. And in this specific case, based on what I just described, they basically add up to food self-sufficiency, which again was one of the key problems that was felt during the COVID pandemic. Now, on the opportunity side, having discussed now the potential issue emerging for the agriculture sector, the more education we have, the more is the potential for services to grow. The more is the access to market at an international level, the more is the competitiveness through entrepreneurship that can be created at the country level that goes back to support employment and GDP. At the same time, everything we do requires resources and we connect back to the cost of imports. Now, this was an exercise done up to this point to analyze the main drivers of change in the system. The next step was to introduce what we see here in orange, the intervention options that could be implemented to change the way in which the system works. And you see, in this case, we add many intervention options across different sectors, across different policy domains, because we want to see how they affect one another to create a synergy and avoid bottlenecks and trade-offs. Now, all this being said, what really matters in the end is that there are different thematic areas that contribute to development in different ways. And through this diagram, we can single out what these different areas are. You see tourism and habitat quality at the center that we explored at the beginning of this sort of storytelling exercise right now, tourism and habitat quality here at the center. Habitat quality affects economic performance together with tourism. Economic performance goes on to affect human health. Public spending is required to support infrastructure. Public spending also goes to education. And here we have impacts on agriculture and land use as well as entrepreneurship. And these economic activity, entrepreneurship as well, go on to affect resource use and imports. So they all play a role and they're all interconnected to one another as thematic areas. Now, if this representation seems complex, we have then simplified them to make so that we can clearly see different strategies emerges, emerging from the diagram. A more conventional approach that is purely focused on one sector, let's say tourism, taken as an example in this case, you will see that there are some green arrows pointing up, meaning development is taking place, but then we have many arrows that are red and pointing down, representing side effects what is emerging that is not desirable. If we take a more systemic approach on the right side, we see most of the arrows being green, indicating that we are actually able to improve performance across the board if we take a more balanced approach, if we focus on knowledge and skill creation as opposed to, in a way, exporting what is already available in the country, the nature, the tourism experience, and so on and so forth. Now, this is to say that in order to create a transformation process, as Veronique mentioned, we need to use that systemic approach that allows us to balance priorities. Because what we've seen in the past is that primarily the goals for recovery were based on an opportunistic approach that values what can deliver growth in the short term. But ultimately, that ends up cementing the historical approach to development. If instead we take the crisis, COVID, or other value chain related challenges that we see now as an opportunity to accelerate the transformation process that we see in a national development plan, in the NDC, the National Determined Contributions or similar documents, then we create the foundations for longer term, resilient and more steady growth. And so this is in a way what emerges from these diagrams. It's a co-creation approach. It creates a shared understanding that allows us to figure out what are the drivers of change, where we can intervene most effectively, potential synergies and side effects emerging from the actions we implement to then identify what is the roadmap and how to make change happen over time. So thank you for your attention and Veronique, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for this uh, presentation. I think the, um, we are, we are reaching uh, the end of the session, but um, as the participants have been very uh, patient, I would definitely like to give the opportunity to some uh, participants to ask questions further to the presentations um, provided at the beginning or um, uh, the, the presentation from uh, Andrea. As you will see, we don't have a lot of time left, but um, I, would I would like to give the floor to um, uh, one person who has been asking a question uh, for example, regarding the, the, the diversification or the, the, uh, the planning, um, you know, the diversification of the economy. 
um, or anybody else who would like to take the floor, please go ahead and uh, shortly introduce yourself. Thank you. Thanks, Saba Bukhari from UNESCO. Um, I think you've, uh, I think Andreas, uh, Andrea uh, responded to my question really, explained the, the idea of diversifying the economy. It's just that um, since there's so many SIDS on this group, uh, I think one would have to work each with each one of them in, independently to ensure that they all have a viable strategy in place. Otherwise, we're just generalizing things again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Somebody, uh, some other questions? Does somebody else want to ask a question to Andrea or to others? Uh, maybe um, if I shortly, if I may shortly, uh, a question to Mr. Uh, um, yeah, to Mrs. Agatin, if um, what is in your view the key task uh, your new national development strategy has to help Seychelles accomplish? And uh, how can it promote better collaboration between ministries and more efficient budget allocations in support of the SDGs? Mrs. Agatin? Thank you uh, for the question. If I understood correctly, in terms of our new one, what is it that it will help Seychelles achieve, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I think for us, first and foremost, it, it's achieving that long-term vision of the country. And I think it will also help us to achieve uh, first that economic transformation that we seek to bring about a little bit more um, resilience in the face of ad adversities and, and external shocks. So this is what we're looking at, that the new sort of cycle of planning will, will bring about for us. And in terms of the linkages with the budget, again, bring in that element of prioritization and efficiency, because we know um, resources is, is not as available as it was before. Everybody is constrained uh, by what is available, even domestically, uh, to sort of mobilize resources. It's not as easy as uh, one anticipates. So in, in terms of that linking with budgeting, it's a little bit more of that prioritization and efficiency of the spending and how we, we focus uh, on, on the priorities in, in the face of limited resources. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and maybe I have one final question to Mr. Gora uh, with regards to uh, private stakeholders. Uh, private uh, stakeholders is a key stakeholder in the transformation required to achieve the SDGs. And integrated approaches emphasize issue-based versus sector-based conversations that are attractive for the private sector. Um, how can uh, could this be leveraged more by governments to get uh, business on board? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I think uh, Mauritius has a very, very long uh, and rich history of uh, strong uh, public-private sector collaboration. And uh, we have several platforms where there is uh, this constant dialogue uh, between the private sector and government, including also um, the civil society about the uh, national vision and how government uh, rally uh, the private sector towards a common goal. Let me tell you that uh, each quarter, on a quarterly basis, the Minister of Finance uh, uh, meets the, uh, his colleagues in the private sector uh, uh, apex body, what you call the business Mauritius on a quarterly basis to discuss issues of uh, national interest and also uh, to uh, talk about uh, new policy measures and programs and, that can be developed and also implemented uh, in the national budget. And uh, apart from that, we have a strong uh, uh, CSO element where the private sector contributes around 2% of their uh, profits to, uh, to programs, projects linked with uh, poverty, alleviation, environment, and so on. So we have a strong uh, dose, a strong uh, culture of uh, both private sector and uh, public sector cooperation. And this probably has been one of the cornerstone that have drive the economic success of Mauritius. 
Thank you. Uh, further to um, uh, Saba Bokari's uh, comment, I think it's uh, quite important indeed uh, that, um, um, th th I mean, we, we highlighted several times the participatory dimension, plus the fact that the, the, the government has a key role in facilitating basically these kind of bringing together the different stakeholders and making sure that in, in view of the fact that there is indeed a very limited capacity and uh, human resources, which was highlighted by Mrs. Um, Agatin, um, it is important to, to, to basically join the forces and make sure that the this um, effort is done uh, in a collaborative and a participative manner. Um, um, so just to highlight that and um, also highlighting that uh, the institutional reforms um, are therefore also important so that some institutional uh, changes will have to be made to make it to make this more effective and to make strategic planning more effective, which we know is one of the, 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 weak, the weakest uh, dimensions in, um, in the implementation of the SDGs. Institutional reforms are challenging. Uh, so many thanks. Um, I see that uh, we have uh, still two hands. Um, we're running out of time, but I still would like to give the floor maybe to uh, Mrs. Herdianti in the Puspita, if I, if I may. Joya, Mrs. Herdianti, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Ms. Veronica. Uh, I will ask to uh, Mr. Andrea Bessi for the model uh, in the poverty. What's your assumption? that you use for build your model. Yes, thank you. So the, the creation of this model was basically done in group sessions. We had participants joining a two hour session. We started with a blank screen, identifying what is the key problem. Uh, sometimes that is economic performance, sometimes it's emission reductions, that it's not coming down as fast as wanted, or, or employment, uh, meaning the high employment rate. And then we proceed step by step to develop the diagram, meaning we look at what are the causes, what are the factors that modify the trends or performance of the indicators you're interested in. And as you can imagine, once we have 10, 15 or 20 participants in the room, if I ask what are the main drivers of unemployment or economic growth, we have very diverse views. At that point, we start adding variables, you know, elements to the diagram one by one, and we discuss it together as a group, whether they're the most relevant ones, other have to be added, what are the relationships existing between the variables. And so at this stage, this is mostly an exercise to gather the views and opinions and elicit knowledge from the participants. What we often do as a next step is to go back and review and validate every connection, every indicator that we add to the diagram by looking for uh, peer-reviewed papers on the research side by looking at data, historical time series from national statistics, so that we can, again, confirm and validate what we've heard from the group of stakeholders that worked with us. At times, we also proceed and develop a mathematical model that then ends up creating the forecasts that Veronique mentioned before, so that we can actually see which ones of the many drivers of change identified become stronger over time, maybe in the short term as opposed to medium term and longer term so that we can effectively carry out that analysis that is across sectors for many economic actors over time and in space in relation, for instance, to the ecosystem impacts. But this is for now at the beginning, a qualitative co-creation approach done with several stakeholders that come from different fields and domains. Okay, so I would like to, so yeah, I would like to give shortly, very shortly, uh, hand over to Joya. And then we have to close this session. Joya? Yes, I'll try to be as short as possible. Thank you, uh, Veronique. I, I actually just had a, a, you know, a question about the way things are actually at the moment done in Mauritius. Maybe Mr. Gura can correct me, but these are the, the annual budget is, is, is a way of, um, you know, every, every year this budget is brought forward. And I believe the exercise is to go to each ministry and ask them about their strategic, uh, you know, and the priorities and so on. But how, how can we link this kind of exercise, which is being done to this uh, systems thinking and making it, uh, I mean, do we, do we actually change the whole process or do we continue that process, but we, we add this component to it? And, uh, you know, maybe this is maybe not the, the platform for that maybe that requires a bit of discussion but i just want to know what is the how to relate both of these things you know the the, the systems thinking and the and the yearly annual budget planning 
Well, that's a very interesting question. I think uh, at this stage, we, we, there's no need to adopt a, like a sort of Big Ben approach. I think we can do it in a like an in, in incremental way. Incremental way where we work on like sectoral strategies. That is for those ministries or sectors where there are already some uh, sectoral strategies in place. Then from there, we need to see how the strategies have been developed, what are the goals, indicators, and targets, what are the resources required to implement those strategies, and how are they aligned with uh, like the uh, national goals. Like I was mentioning earlier, national goals on like uh, renewable energy, on inclusive development, on uh, high income growth, and also on uh, safety aspect like health or resurgence of uh, disease and so on. So we need to see how those uh, sectoral goals are aligned with the uh, national goal. And uh, for that, maybe uh, first I was, the precondition for that, of course, is uh, we need to look at the institutions, the governance aspect, and so on. But right now, we need to adopt a incremental approach until we have a full-fledged economic planning bureau, which I mentioned at the outset. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for uh, these interventions. Um, I, um, I, I really have to apologize, but I think we have to stick to, um, to the timeline. We've already um, passed uh, nine o'clock. Um, I would uh, like to thank all of you for your participation and for, your, um, uh, for taking part in this uh, session. Um, I just wanted to also thank um, um, the different um, uh, participants and uh, the speakers for taking time to make these interventions and um, would like to reaffirm and um, the, the commitment basically from uh, UNDESA UNITAR to support uh, the governments as well as um, the resident coordinator systems to make sure that we are all um, working basically more in 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 um, in, in coherent in a coherent manner and try to support uh, what happens basically the, the try to address the, the, the issues that are of importance uh, for the countries for the governments itself so um, and therefore as uh, Pierre highlighted making sure that all the different agencies as well as the headquarters are basically well connected and are trying to uh, provide a, a coherent and a, and a support in a, in a holistic manner. Uh, so thanks again. We basically still wanted to do a poll, but we don't have the time for that. Uh, thanks again for your time, and I hereby would like to close the session. Thanks a lot for your um, collaboration, and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.